Welcome to the East End Education Forum. Today's topic is supporting learning outside the school day. Bridgehampton Schools 21st Century Community Learning Center. Today's guests are Amanda Candelaria, Hamra Osur, something like that, yes. uh, and Jen Suarez. <laughs> These are three fantastic educators who, with the help of Mr. Miller, Mr. Cox, and these three people, we were able to um, basically plan, manage, and little by little improve the after-school program for the students at Bridgehampton. Uh, their insights were essential in identifying not only the problems we were running into, but the possibilities for improvement. Uh, this 21st century grant, this was a, a grant that the superintendent, Dr. Kelly, secured and provided over $400,000 a year for us to expand on the existing Aspire program. And that Aspire really was really elementary school, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And now we have after school possibilities for pre-K through 12. Mm -hmm. um, when we sat down and we all kind of were thrown into this in the beginning of the year. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was not a, it was not a, okay, we've, we've got six months to plan. It was in three weeks, we have to start providing classes. And we sat down and, and tried to figure out what we wanted this to look like, what we wanted it to feel like, and, and why it would be different for students. And we really didn't want it to be school. And we didn't want it to be keeping kids busy after school. We wanted it to be really preparing kids with those soft skills that I know you, as teachers, you feel like you don't have time to address during the school day, but we all know once you leave the school setting, once you're out in the real world trying to get a job, yeah. it's those soft skills that set you apart and they can't be tested. They're, they're not on the regions. They're not, you know, they can't do it with a multiple choice test. Mm -hmm. So those soft skills, um, working in a group, taking turns, um, you know, setting goals. All those things um, we tried to incorporate into the after school program. So let's, let's take a few minutes and explain our roles because this is different for me. I'm not only the you know, host, the interviewer, but I'm also part of the program. Uh, so I'll start, I, I was dragged out of retirement, <laughs> kicking and screaming, but it was a lot of fun. I became the director of the program uh, after school. Uh, Jen, what's your role? Um, I, besides running several of the clubs myself, uh, helping to organize uh, dismissal, attendance, um, making sure students are where they're supposed to be, um, really kind of also helping to facilitate the overall program. Um. Oh, so Bob, um, I during the day I'm, I'm the literacy and the ENL specialist and the after school program was uh, definitely uh, a new hat that I was wearing and um, oh, many. Yeah, many, yes. <laughs> and uh, so it was exciting. I was running the leadership club, which I pretty much created and trial and error and made it into a um, wonderful program that I'll, I'll discuss further. And um, I was also the instructional coach. And basically what I was doing there was I was aligning um, the curriculum standards so that I would talk to many of the teachers and find out what their program was like so that it was aligned with the standards and also if they also needed any um, needs, uh, learning about the student body, especially if it was someone outside of the school, I was there to support them in every way I can. Right. Yeah, we do have outside groups coming in to offer yeah, some of the workshops. And Amanda? I, if I wasn't teaching a class, I was just overseeing multiple classes. Um, making my presence known in lots of different rooms <laughs> with lots of different age groups and um, going off of what Homer said, like making sure things are standard aligned. Uh, you and I talked about just because it's aligned with the standards doesn't mean that it has to lack luster. So I just feel yeah. popping into every room, I was able to, you know, help teachers come up with new ideas. And, and I think we said it a little more bluntly. I think we said align with the standards doesn't have to be boring. <laughs> doesn't have to be right. boring. Right. Yeah. Right. Doesn't have to lack luster or be boring. Right. Right. So I think um, my role was really just communicating with the students and with the teachers, but also overseeing yeah. the whole program itself. 
Now, we started out by just getting a schedule together and we were bringing in outside people. We were creating, you were creating classes amongst staff. Um, and when we started in October, I think it was October, yeah, it was October 11th, 10th? 12th, 14th. What, <laughs> one of those days. Within in, the, the in, time frame. In, in, in yeah. about mid-October, um, we had a schedule where there were 12 to 15 different possibilities for students mm -hmm. every day of the week, which we, I remember being so excited that we had put all that together. Um, with that, we had those new partners coming in. We had Project Most, iCamp, um, Hudson Music Studios, mm -hmm. and, and a couple of others. But talk about that, because I know you guys actually went into those classrooms. Talk about the experience that um, the students have in, in an eye camp. I know you were in eye camp often. I was in eye camp often. It was a, it was really awesome to see the um, the skills that they were teaching our kids, as well as um, introducing them to new technologies and new programs. Um, not only just you know having the building, but also using the coding skills right. and really kind of honing in on you know those like keeping up with the new technology that's out there. Yeah. I mean, I was amazed that these were first graders, second graders, yeah. that they had them basically learning the precursors of coding. Mm -hmm. they, they were starting to do block coding um, at, at that age, and I, I wonder if I could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I just wanted to add, um, I also worked with uh, Hudson Music Rock Camp, mm -hmm. and I was very impressed at the fact that here was someone who came into our school and was able to mix a range of grades, working together with all these elaborate instruments. And then during our holiday uh, feast, feast yeah. they actually got a chance to perform. Yeah. Yes. And it was very sweet because while everybody was um, gathering and eating, um, we actually got to, they got to showcase the music yeah. that they were learning. Yeah, that was a pleasant surprise. And I got an email today that they're having another show at the end Yes, of the they oh, are. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, you yeah. ruined that surprise. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I'm sorry. Um, and, and Project Most. They have multiple classes going on. Yeah. What? What? Give me. Give me a feel for Project Mo because they. They. They're involved in almost every school district out here. Yeah. So they have an expertise in this area. Jen, I know you have a lot of experience with Project Mo as well. I know my experience with them, and the after school program was mostly art. Yeah. Um, you know, the beauty of them coming to the school is they're getting a perspective from a different teacher, different materials, and they're giving kids opportunities to create, explore make mistakes, turn mistakes into art. And, you know, they're really seeing the impact of the decisions that they're making as little as yeah. picking a color and, you know, where to glue something and, and there's no right or wrong. So it's a, a risk-free creative outlet for our kids. It's been great. And they also offered uh, their dance. They had dance, uh, whether it was um, hip hop and like tap and really kind of introducing the students to different genres of music, mm -hmm. um, as well as different like ways to explore music using their bodies. Um, and then, you know, now we have Zumba, which is like, yeah, we're taking yes. it to the yes. next yes. level. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then I think we got off to a good start, but I remember feeling very confident that we did a great job. And then about a month later saying, oh, we missed a lot. You know, I, I felt like, okay, we, we made some decisions that we need to rethink. Yeah. Um, let's talk about that because I think you already mentioned trial and error in, in, in your leadership club. Uh, I think one of the things we want to be as a theme for students is trial and error. Like that's, yeah. that's how things really get done. Um, and for us, it was the same thing. We were putting something together and then saying, okay, we don't have time to do anything else. We're ready as, as we can be at this point but we want to continually look at it and look to improve. So let's talk about some of the, you know, things we, we knew we had to switch up right in the beginning. Well, I mean, first of all, we, we have two bus. So we have a 345 and 44, 445. So when you're involved, especially in the, in the club that I was working with, the leadership, when we had a major project involved, I had to, I realized early on that I had to get out of the mindset of a classroom teacher and start looking at this class as just a, more like a workshop. Mm -hmm. That this is an area where they get to come in, they know what their responsibilities are, whether they complete it by a certain time, 
wasn't so much the issue of like, oh, it needs to be done by, you know, 3 p.m. Now you have the structure of time is expanded and looked at it in a different way. So when I had to design, redesign the class, I had to do it in a way that I knew that if they left at any point during that time, they could still come back and continue working. Right. So think about it. You're basically doing project-based learning, mm -hmm. but in a way that, and most projects are like this, it's individualized. Yes. They, well, they, yeah. they, they're, yeah. they're moving from their starting point, wherever that may be each right. day, to as far as they can get that day. Right. And it, it isn't like you have to say, okay, class, stop. You right. know, th they're choosing not only their path, but how fast, quickly they're gonna move along that path. Exactly, and it was very goal-driven. So each one of them were given a role that they decided among themselves as a team. So that even if they left, then they were now allowing someone else in their team saying, okay, now that I'm leaving, you can take over. And each time I had a different manager in place that they decide who was that would constantly manage the situation and the time. And they're constantly being held accountable, which is part of the leadership qualities. Right. And I know there's something with bus announcements that we originally <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, So like originally, well, we first started out with three buses and I think that that just became too much. Yes. And it really kind of limited um, some of the students or like at least limited the length of the program a little bit. So we started, you know, just to make sure that, you know, because we had so many outside facilitators as well as teachers involved in this, um, that we started doing the announcements every day. Um, and then eventually like Amanda and I are just like, well, why are we the ones doing this? Like, let's start pulling the kids and let, yeah. let's start like really building on their skills and, you know, now we have every day we uh, try and pull students from every grade level to do the yeah, announcements kids are begging with us. To participate. Oh, absolutely! Hey, it's public speaking. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. a lot of kids. I mean, some of them are. They have just learned how to speak English in the last year. Yes, or so, right. And you're making an announcement that the entire school is hearing. I mean, that's amazing. Like, I just got to think of a couple of students right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you've seen them grow in just the two or three times that they've done it. How much better they've gotten at doing it. So. Yeah. Well, and their confidence, like they have, their, they're building their confidence when it comes to, and it's once again taking ownership in, you know, what they're creating and just their public speaking. And, you know, we want um, our English language learners to, to, you know, be able to speak conversationally. Yeah. yeah. But often in school, how we assess that isn't real. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's in a sheltered environment. Now you're taking them and you're putting them on a microphone. Yeah. Right. yeah. Now it's real. Now, <laughs> yeah. now, now I, I want to do this well, not because I'm going to get a good grade, not because it's going to make my teacher happy, because I'm going to be thrilled with myself because yeah. I did it well. That's We're actually fostering intrinsic motivation, which rarely happens yeah. in elementary grades. Mm -hmm. So that, that's it sounds like a little thing, <laughs> but it's a big thing. Yeah. It's a big thing. And it also builds a community, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, they. I just know that whenever I'm in the room and I hear one of those announcements, <laughs> one of the students immediately say, oh, is that so-and-so? Yeah. And it just it builds on that collaboration, that community that we all, yeah. you know, thrive on. Yeah, positive mm -hmm. acknowledgement. Yeah. You know, they're telling each other, nice job, hey, good job. each other on the back, yeah. yeah. It's a feel-good thing. And also, I remember our first advisory board meeting. We had students at the advisory board mm -hmm. meeting. Yeah. And... We actually made some significant changes based on what the students told us at the meeting, that the older kids, we, we were having trouble with getting older kids to attend. Mm -hmm. And one of the high school students said, there's an hour wait between the end of school and the first thing that's available for the older students. And when he said that, you know, I, I was like, God, how did we miss that? You know, yeah. it was like so obvious that yes, uh, at me as a high school student, I'm not sitting around waiting for an hour yeah. to do to do a club. You know, I'm gone. Yeah, we made that adjustment, and the attendance for the high school kids oh, went up quite yeah, a bit. Significantly, yeah, significant yeah. change. That was one of the biggest adjustments I think we made to the yeah. program. Yeah, and and time. really shortening up a bit, and, and everything yeah. I think got tighter and fell into place much yeah. better after that adjustment. And it was one of our students who helped us through that. Yeah. yeah. So let's get into some of the, uh, you know, activities we're doing. I know you're working on uh, K through two 
uh, K through to K through second graders. Um, tell us a little bit about that group you have. So there's a variety of programs going on in K through two. Um, we've got cooperative play. We've got Legos, blocks. Help me out if I miss any. Well, don't tell me about cooperative play because that that sounds. That's like home for me, cooperative yeah. play. <laughs> I remember it was your idea. If you that don't was, know it, where I am, it, it, come yeah. check in cooperative play. I'm probably in so there. Tell tell us about you know people outside of education. So how, why do you have to teach cooperative play? So it it again it sounds like something that you don't need to teach, but you'd be surprised the skills that the kids are practicing when they're in cooperative play. Um, they're learning how to take turns. They're learning how to, you know, pass out materials. They're practicing patience. These are all teamwork and team building skills that mm -hmm. kids need as they get older. So to be able to practice it now and again in that risk-free or low-risk environment, um, you know, we're, we're giving kids that opportunity and they're having fun while they're doing that. And I think for any teacher, that's that's always the goal of anything is, you know, you want the kids to want to be there as much as you want them to be there. So I, I actually noticed that even with the older students, how important that skill is that we just take for granted. And I think we can't deny the effect of COVID and how many of these young children were in isolation yeah. and that they missed out on those basic skills. So some a class like cooperative play that you would think that is very natural in the preschool age yeah. um, is not as visible as it is now and it needs to be brought back. Yeah. And so it's, it's great to hear that we have that. A lot of it is also like it's their first ex like exposure to a school environment or just an, uh, an outside environment other than their homes. Like, right. you know, several of these students are, you know, only siblings, like they don't have any siblings. Yeah. Like, so, you know, like learning how to work with others and because it's open to preschool, like that I think is a huge component to it because it's just that, you know, they're for this, their first exposure to school. Right. You know, one of the games that they play and cooperative play, and again, it may seem like something really silly or simple or easy or something that you could do at home that really isn't so easy to do at home is they pass a ball around mm -hmm. and they're practicing um, making eye contact yeah, right, and speaking right. with one another in ways that are respectful and also not just speaking to another, but also listening. Mm -hmm. So I know in our classroom, we also call that TTL, turn, talk, and listen. Right. And so just giving them a chance to practice that with each other, again, while having fun is just... You know, and all during essential. COVID, they were doing that only on a screen. Yeah. Yeah. Or behind a mask. Or behind a mask, yeah. yeah. So it, it, they did miss some developmental opportunities, yes. Yeah. So What else is going on in that age group? You, you mentioned a few things before, and I cut you off. Oh, There's okay. ICAM. <laughs> ICAM. What, um, yeah. Legos. 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 That's another one, uh, another room that you'll typically find me in. So Legos right now is a very open-ended program. Uh, we're looking to restructure the Legos in a way that will encourage them to like compete with each other. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of healthy competition, okay? Uh, but for now, it's really just um, expressing themselves creatively. So mm -hmm. typically you'll find kids who are not in the same classes sitting at the same table sharing a pile of Legos. And wow. you know, each day they're making decisions on whether they want to continue what they started the time before do they want to completely take apart their Lego structure and start fresh? Um, are they adding on to something mm -hmm. that they already built? So just going through that thought process, they're learning, you know, how they want to express yeah. themselves. There are curriculums on like Lego challenges, I believe, yeah. right? Like building bridges and how, how, how long a bridge can you, you know, construct without yeah. having a collapse. Uh, that, that would be a good place to take mm -hmm. that program. That and would, again, standard fun. aligned, but not boring. <laughs> yes. yeah, and, and it sounds silly, but the standards, which I think get a bad rap, um, are good. I've never read anything in a standard that I said, oh, I wouldn't want a student to know how to do that or be able to, to know that knowledge yeah. or to be able to uh, accomplish that skill. Right. Um, but because of the testing that goes and seems to be attached to standards, they've gotten a, a bad rap. You know, I, I want 
every kid who graduates from every school on the island to have those skills. Yeah. Right. Um, they're good. They will help them succeed. Um, but some of them can't be tested. Right. And those standards are very just basic. It's it's more like a blueprint. Yeah. So when you're playing with Legos, you basically are doing math. You're doing spatial relationships. Yeah. And these are components of the standards where you're analyzing, comparing, identifying, um, whether it's as basic as the colors, um, number of Legos you're yeah. using. And those are the components that, you know, are put together and knowing that you're doing something fun but you're learning at the same time. Right. Without, how amazing is that? Right. Fun yeah. without, you know, right. learning without even realizing it, that you're, you know, you're having fun at the same time. All right. So, Hamra, tell us a little bit about your, <laughs> your leadership group and, and what, what the incredible project you did with the food trucks. Yeah, I mean, when I started with leadership, it was really um, challenging. It was quite a venture. I didn't, you know, I didn't know how should I you know, design this, how should I go about it? And I remember having a discussion with you, Bob, saying how, have a discussion with the students, have a talk with them, see what their ideas are. And um, and and then from there, we kind of manifested into so many, so many different little projects. And one project in particular that um, I'm extremely proud of is our food truck festival. It took literally um, approximately three months and it's something that I would have never um, been able to have the courage to do in the classroom with all of the time pressure. But this is a fantastic um, experiment and project that we got to do in the after school program where the kids actually created, they built three teams, three different types of food trucks. They, they named their food truck, they designed their food truck, they cr literally created a whole business plan and with each and every component, I uh, documented the whole uh, experience. And the students were in collaboration with each and every step. Each one of their teammates, I call them their investors. And what are their roles? Each week they decided on who the different manager was. And as they were building it from what the meal plan was to how they were going to advertise to what the meal were, what the meals are going to even look like. They actually use Play-Doh to actually show a sample of the food. And as an art teacher, Jen, you would, I mean, I think you got a chance oh, to no, see Oh, no, I, some I got to that. see it, and I was yeah. like, It <gasps> was phenomenal, you know? Yeah, and so I... We have, some, we have some photos oh, of it, yeah, yeah. which is cool. And, and, and they had such a great time, and they would come in, they would know exactly what to do, because I would give them a, uh, you know, a checklist of just say, these are the, you know, the points that you just need to um, try to cover. And then um, and then every now and then I would be like, ring a bell. I'm like, uh, uh impromptu status meeting, status meeting. <laughs> so then everybody's like, what's going on? And I'm like, go to your quarters. We're having a status meeting. And then each group, I'm like, okay, now how long is your food truck? How long is this going to take? When are we going to be open for business? Because we're going to have customers soon. And uh, then they would like have to be accountable. They had to all own up onto what they were doing. And it was real life experiences. And when they actually got a chance to execute the food truck, and I, I didn't even tell the school, honestly, I just covered the whole school lobby with like, you know, uh, you know, their food truck, a banner of their food truck, the actual, they used a shoebox as what it would look like of the, uh, of the food truck. And then they used Legos as the design of the interior of the food truck. Um, then they had a threefold of explaining what their business model was, as well as I had someone, um, one of the uh, assistant teachers was, uh, was managing the money. So we would have each person come in and from other uh, clubs, yeah. and we would have yeah. them with pretend money and say, we're doing it in an imaginary food truck business where you're actually gonna go and go to, to whichever food truck that you like and get to purchase the food, and the students got to pretend like they were making the food um, using the samples of the Play-Doh, and then also actually having photocopies of different samples of certain items, and then putting that together behind the huge banner that they made. And then uh, each one of them would have a role, whether it was building manager, uh, food manager, Yelp manager, because at the end, whenever the customer yeah, was done, <laughs> yep. they had to go and, and talk about their experience of how um, how they had made placed their order, how quickly they got their order, and their customer experience. And they rated it from one to five stars. And that alone was 
how the group worked together immediately because the minute one of them didn't get five stars on their own, they would have an immediate meeting and say, hey, what happened? The Yelp manager would immediately go to to their teammates and say, what happened? What's going on here? And then one of them would be like, oh, well, you know, we're, we're short staffed. You know, one of our teammates had to catch the 345 bus, so Aww. I'm doing three rolls now. You know, give me a break. You know, and it's like, well, you can't be yelling at the customers. We just got three stars. So, you know, these are real life experiences. So it was exciting to see. So Yelp was an assessment. Yes, yeah. it was. It was. Yeah. It was. Yeah. I remember when you were doing this, you showed me a little video clip of you discussing the project with one of the groups and in their plan they were telling you that you know they had their food truck all you know laid out and they were going to have um child care in the food truck yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and they were going to give two tours of the inside of the food mm -hmm. truck and you this was in the planning stage and you let them plan for that you didn't correct them you didn't say you know it might be a little tight um, you let them plan for that. And a, a lot of, in a traditional classroom, that would be, how could you let them make a mistake? Yeah. You know? But when you think about the science of learning, that mistake and being able to go along the process, self-correct, realize your own mistake, correct it, say, oh, we can't do that, go back and rethink it and then move forward, they'll never forget that. They'll ne if you had said, no, you don't have enough room to do that, and this is how you do it and move on, they, that wouldn't have been anywhere near as deep a learning experience as allowing them to struggle, make the mistake. Productive struggle. Productive yeah. struggle, come back to it, and then move forward. Um, that's what can happen in these settings, yeah, which, which is lacking in, in traditional classrooms. Um, I, would, I was, remember, I was so, I was so yeah, thrilled to see you let them is, go. It is, because, you know, as teachers, and especially as my role during the day, when I push into classrooms, um, I get a chance to see how much talking goes on with the teachers. And I just wanted to, and it's hard not to do that because you're trying to like quickly get things done. And it's a really a matter of like letting go mm -hmm. and saying, no, whether it happens or it doesn't happen, it's the process. And what grades were in, were in that? Process? So this is grades three to five. Three to five. So. Yeah. Youngsters. Yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. And so it was multiple grades also working together, which was exciting. Because right. what you had just said about um, in, in the normal classroom that the teacher does a lot of the talking. Yeah. I, I, I've probably sat in over a thousand classrooms and observed lessons throughout my career. And that's what teachers are told to do. I, I, I can never blame teachers for that because we've spent so much the administrators, me, uh, saying, you know, th these tests are important. The three through eight tests are so important um, and they've got to do well on those. Teachers feel so much pressure to make Absolutely. sure students yeah. know the stuff. Right. Uh, so they narrow it down to here's the stuff you have to know. And that's why it's boring. And, and that's and I, I don't blame teachers. I blame we administrators who, who set the tone for that. Um, the idea of project-based learning, which we can play with in the after-school program, that's, that can be a much more productive learning experience for students. And I'm, I'm hoping that the experience in the afternoon can start to trickle into the day. Yeah. Right. That, that it, and one of the things we have to think about if that's ever going to happen is, what are your periods? 39 minute periods? 38. Yeah. 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 Thinking about that as, as a limiting factor to education. Um, and that's every district has to start rethinking that. Right. Well, that's the lightning, mo the lightning moment, the aha moment that I had was that you look at time differently. Yes. You know, you don't have the pressure because as a teacher, you're constantly like, oh, I have to cover this. I have to cover right. that. Right. So that's why there's so much talking. I'm a guilty of that myself. But then when you're driven by the process, and knowing that the product isn't as important as the process, yeah. then it just becomes such an amazing experience. And that's a lifelong, uh, you know, practice that we want these kids to leave Bridgehampton with. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, Jen and Amanda, you both were working on the play. Yes, our fall play. The fall play. <laughs> so, so <laughs> how, the, how does 
that experience exemplify this discussion? You know, the, the, this idea of project-based and, and the fact that failure is a, is a learning experience and a good thing. Um, I remember having a discussion with teachers, a group of teachers about allowing kids to fail. And there was one teacher who was just, just so, it was an affront. It was like, how could I ever do that? Yeah. Um, but it's how learning happens. Yeah, you, know, you make and, mistakes, and, and, you learn from them. I mean, you know, and, we do it as teachers as well. Oh, yeah, we, we, I think there's one mistake that uh, Ms. Suarez and I made. <laughs> one? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> with the play, with the play. And we, I guess, overshot um, our time frame. Yeah. And we had to last minute change from a fall play to a holiday play of yeah. sorts. Um, you know, we I guess with the way the schedules were changing mm. and, you know, the fluidity of the program itself, kids coming and leaving or deciding not yeah, to stay. It was, uh, it was there was a learning curve yes, there for us. So definitely. But, you know, we put our, our big beautiful brains together. Yes, we, we figured did. it out. <laughs> and you know what? And the students designed every aspect of it between and they were the, flexible the, the, the whole set, time. the you know like their costumes, like, you know, and it was open to like, you know, the K pre-K through 12. So you had, you know, early, like young elementary working with upper secondary in, in efforts to designing. We had a student who was like our announcer and like, you know, our, um, Oh, what do you call those? The MC. Yeah, yeah, the MC. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it really, and at the end of the day, it, it all came together. Like it was, and, you know, we recorded and they had a blast. And even now, and I, I'm sure, Amanda, you get the same thing. Like we have, you know, kids coming up to us. When are we going to do another one? Mm -hmm. Like we want to do another one. Like it was just, a, it, it was really beautiful. Now, how many students were involved in that? You had... K through 12, but uh, how many kids? I would I say about 30. Yeah, right? 35. And it depends on the day. Right, right around there. Yeah. Um, Which is good because there's a lot of components uh, to putting on a play. Suarez and I have also done the play in the summertime, which yes. is different. Summertime, you know, it's a lot less structured mm -hmm. as it should be in summertime. Um, but we had a lot more time in the summertime. Yeah. But so I think we took what we've done in the past and kind of tweaked it. To figure out, okay, we still have all these components of we need some people to work on like stage crew elements of the play. We need some students to just work on, you know, the artistic components of the play, yeah. uh, the music yeah. part of the play, mm -hmm. the singing, you know, um, the stage fright was even another component that we yes, had to work through with them. Yeah. And there were kids who were talking on that microphone who. I mean, maybe never even would have had a chance to talk on a microphone yeah. if we didn't run a play. I mean, at least not until they were older. So, you know, starting them with these programs at a younger age, it's it's showing us yeah. what they're capable of. And I think we're, we're like Hamra, learning how to let the reins go. Yeah. And just, you it's know. Not and easy. And it's hard. It's yeah. really it's hard. It's not easy. Especially when you often feel like you're judged by the order of your classroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I remember when, <laughs> my first day as a principal. It was a middle school. And I was walking down the hall with the assistant principal who had been there for many years. And he said, See, hear how quiet it is? You could hear a pin drop here. And he was very proud of that. And my response was, I, I know we have to fix that. Because I just saw kids who were bored to death. You know, and, and yes, they were orderly, and yes, everything got covered. The curriculum got covered, but the students weren't intellectually engaged yeah. in that curriculum. Right. You know, and that's more 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 the, the rule of thumb than not. Um, yeah. yeah. So, what else happened in the in the play? What what, what other? I would say like, even like I was really impressed with our our narrators and like building on the script and even you know really kind of you know you think you know well a narrator and you know working on a mic 
and having students work and helping each other with their fluency and with their reading was huge. Yeah. Um, we kept reminding the narrators too that like as the narrator, you're also guiding the the actors and yeah. the actresses in the play. Mm -hmm. So you're giving them the cue to move forward. So they're they're working on again team building, interpersonal skills yeah. all while putting on a play. I mean you know, there's a lot involved, too, with just the commitment to sticking to the role. Yeah. And then having the actors, like, listening, you know, for those cues or, you know, and even, like, the backstage crew. Like, it was really a community effort. And, and again, there was an assessment, but it wasn't on paper and pencil. Yeah. It was real. It was, yeah. uh, how well did I do my job? And, mm -hmm. and the person who was probably harshest was the person who was assessing themselves. <laughs> that how it usually works. Yeah. So we did get to put on a play, and we did have a pretty large crowd yeah, in attendance. Nice. And yeah, yeah, nice. It was a feel and, good, and feel again, good show. The product was something real. Yeah, yeah. cool. Talking about real products, you had your your artwork, your, the Bridgehampton Museum Photography Show, and also the uh, College Portfolio Group. Yes. So oh, what should we bit. start with first? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's, well, what, let me see. What photos come up first? We, we have some pictures of. I'm trying to find bring, them. Bring up second. the next slide. Okay, which uh, one was that? So this is the, the Bridgehampton Museum. So yeah. this is our um, the photography show. Um, so this was open to students from, you know, 9 through 12. And what it was is like what it emphasized or what the emphasis was is was working with, uh, you know, the community. And really, you know, these the kids came up with the idea of, um, you know, uh, this whole project was based off of like working hands, okay. and which was very interesting because you know that this was really kind of student led, and it, it became to a uh, a tell your story kind of moment. So the students would go out, or and and they would you know find these individuals amongst the community, and they started photographing their hands. And, you know, you would think like, you know, some aspect of that is like who they belong to. And, you know, looking at the, the details of someone just by looking at their hands. And, you know, some people, you know, have or are, are, are living like, um, you know, they've lived a life. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that really kind of spiraled into like in having these students talk about uh, why they chose those individuals and what uh, was in their thought process. And a lot of it was from their own personal stories, you know, whether it was like, you know, being in this country for the first time or like within recent years and, you know, photographing someone who they always, you know, whether they see them at church or at the local coffee shop. Um, and it's really kind of, it started bridging this, um, this idea of that we are, you know, our community is outside of these walls of our school, right. that it's where we are. Um, and, and, and that's also part of the theme of the grant, too, yes. to make sure we bring the community yes. into the school. Yeah. And, and then you have the uh, college portfolio group. Yes. Um, so within recent years... Uh, we've had students um, applying, you know, to art schools, whether it's performing, uh, performance art, visual art. Um, and unfortunately, during the time during the school day, there is not enough time for these students. You know, most um, kids don't know that when they're applying to colleges and applying to these schools, they need a portfolio of all of the work that they've created. And usually most schools have certain guidelines or certain um restraints. So now it came to working with the seniors uh, that were in efforts into pursuing the arts and, you know, really kind of looking at what the schools were looking for, what they wanted to show, what the schools are capable of doing. Um, and as well as even colleges are now, you know, accepting work. It's not necessarily a portfolio, but um, you know, whether it's writing samples or extra work that they would like to include, mm -hmm. basically to really kind of give the colleges an insight or admissions an insight onto who that individual is. Um, I wonder if that will 
be more the norm as the focus on things like the SATs seems to be I, dropping. I, uh, <laughs> some sort of balance. Yes, I agree. Nice. I, I think that's where it's starting to go towards. Um, so even working with, uh, you know, I had students that were in, you know, juniors or sophomores um, that started to get the idea of, well, you know, they already know that they want to pursue the arts um, outside of high school. So, you know, starting to build up that portfolio and having a plethora that they can choose from and show, you know, uh, these places that, you know, who they are as an individual. And, you know, and it's giving them the opportunity, you know, a lot of times, you know, meeting with students during their lunch periods or during, and it, it's rushed. And now with this, this program, you know, we're able to sit and, you know, not worry about the 38 minutes that we have together, but really kind of sit and build and critique each other and, you know, grow um, within the arts. I wonder how many people, how many adults uh, in their job could handle working in 38 minute blocks. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it, it's really it's, not reality. It's, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we did mention that we want to bring the community in, and one of the ways we, we did that this year was Zumba. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You, you started off with a group inside. Talk, talk about that, because you so, expanded. So definitely, I wanted to add that diversity piece, bring the community together, and what better way than other than art, and then food, but with music, brings the world together. Um, in the past, I had done this big ballroom dancing and, and um, the kids loved it. And now I wanted to, you know, and I've done Zumba before, but I wanted to add two elements to it. One was to try to get more secondary students, which is always a challenge. Um, our elementary program is very rock solid where, you know, we always have students attending. Secondary can always be a little challenging, um, trying to get them to come other than their sporting events. Um, and, uh, and then we added the last hour for the parents because parents need, you know, deserve some fun. <laughs> and so we're trying to grow that so that the parents of Bridgehampton as well as the community of Bridgehampton are welcome to come to our Zumba class. And it's a lot of fun. I work with Sabrina. She's amazing. I've, I've um, been her student for many, many, many years. Um, and it's, it's a way, great way of bringing everybody together through a fun dance and hearing all this international music and connecting with everyone with laughing and moving. And it's a workout. And it's oh, a workout. Oh, yeah, and yeah. it's a workout. <laughs> yeah. And again, it's it's another piece of COVID. Uh, even with the adults, I've noticed that, you know, we don't have enough recreational programs for adults as well. Mm -hmm. You know, they miss that social aspect too. So even just the, the, the engagement with doing an activity together, you forget about your day. You know, just like with art, you forget your day. You're doing, your, your mind is focused on that task, your mindset. It's just so important to have that creative outlet. Mm -hmm. And then even having a couple of minutes where you get to talk to the person beforehand or after class. Those couple of minutes is, I know it makes a world of difference for me whenever Sorry. I go, yeah. you know? And <laughs> yeah. I think I think also even with the fitness room that even mm -hmm. just, it's not even just the exercise itself, but the people that, you surround yourself with that social piece, mm -hmm. those social activities, whether it's dancing um, or other activities, you know, it's fantastic. And that's, again, what brings our community together. Yeah. And another thing that Grant has given us is the ability to open the fitness room yeah. for yeah. an extensive yeah. period of time. Yeah, um, it's been a which, lot of fun. Yeah, that was kind of like the fail safe. If, if you had nothing to do, you could always go. Uh -huh. yeah. Lift some weights. <laughs> and the younger Drop, guys, run. the younger kids, they see the Zumba. They see the fitness center. Yeah, yeah. It's something that they're looking forward to. I mean, what better way to introduce kids to wellness, wellness. and yeah. health yes. and exercise than just showing them that this this could be you once you're old yeah. enough. Sure. This could be you. And I've also got into some great discussions um, in the fitness room with members of the community that I would never have had an opportunity yeah. to speak with. And they've come up to me and they wanted to more, know more about Bridgehampton. And it's like, wow this is incredible. I didn't know that. And it's just getting to know your next door neighbor that yeah. we, we lost, you know, lost, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I grew up in the city where I lived in an apartment building and, you know, and just knowing your next door neighbor, I actually sometimes feel like I knew more about my building and the people who lived in my building than I do on my block, you know, with, with the houses that we live in, mm -hmm. especially out here when, 
um, there's another summer community, you know. Um, so it's nice, and I think it's so important that we have these activities. It really just makes our day. Yeah. I mean, one of the other things we were able to do was bring in a speaker. We brought in Alfie Cohen. I don't know if any of you guys were able to come to that, but he's a, a well-known speaker about educational initiatives, and he his topic was unconditional parenting, and it was well attended, and that was done in partnership with the Bridgehampton Community Center in January. So I'm hoping that next year we can offer more of, of these type of uh, activities for the community also. Mm -hmm. um, so we've almost wrapped up our first year. We're almost done. Um, and I think we grew, we learned a lot. <laughs> but now think about next year. How are we gonna improve and what new pieces can we add to the puzzle? Jen, what do you think? You had a couple of ideas. I remember you were running by me. Um, oh, you mean uh, for the community? For yes. sure. Yes. Um, so I know a lot of our students, and it's really kind of, I, I wanted that readiness for when they leave high school right. or like when they leave school and just being, you know, community members and being active members within this awesome community that we live in. And part of that was, is I know most of our students are, you know, working in the summertime, whether it's nannying or, you know, babysitting or, you know, doing, you know, restaurant work, um, you know, so summer camp, too. summer camp as well. Yeah. And, you know, I really wanted to bring, um, you know, CPR and first aid classes for not only for parents that are here, um, but also for our students. You know, those are life saving skills that, you know, could be used anywhere. And it's just that that knowledge, um, you know, that can really, you know, make an impact on someone's life. And I really wanted to facilitate that for um, our community members and for our, our students. So who would you bring in for that? How does that work? Um, so I've already been in a discussion with, uh, right now, the Bridgehampton Firehouse. Um, so they plan on coming in. I've been working with Taylor. Um, and talking to Taylor about it, we actually just received um, CPR and first aid, you know, as a part of our faculty meeting um, for the, um, the teachers as well as the faculty at the school. Um, so, you know, bringing them in and, you know, building that relationship as well as, you know, um, I wanted to bring in the community to create a mural. Um, to, to yeah, <laughs> um, having, you know, parents and community members come in and paint and help design uh, a mural that can be shown within our school or, you know, even perhaps maybe in the town. Like, I would love to paint the town. <laughs> paint the town, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Different kind of paint the town. Than, yes. Yeah. Um, think about it. That would be fantastic to get the side yes. of a building in town to have a mural done by our students yeah I that actually was... yeah I actually see that because we we uh, uh, go to Hoboken quite often mm -hmm. and just walking down the streets they just take something like an ugly feature like a you know a metal box that's usually an eyesore on the on, on the on the streets and they make it into a beautiful art art mural and how wonderful it would be if, yeah. like, we start to extend that outside of um, mm -hmm. just our yeah. school mural, but now do projects throughout the, the neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. You know, Beautified these little eyesores. Beautify Bridgehampton. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> and, 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 and a lot is in walking distance to the schools, right? Oh, right absolutely. Here. Yeah. yeah. You know, oftentimes, you know, how often do we walk into town, like, as a school or within our classes? Yeah. Whether it's, you know, facilitating scribble stones or even when we do our Halloween parade, mm -hmm. it's, you know... Why not? Yeah. So if anybody listening to this has, has, a, has a side of a building they want to donate, uh, that, would be, that would be fantastic. Let, let us know. Yeah, that, that, would that, that would be yeah. great. Or even, you know, something as like project mapping. So even being able to create a space or, you know, let's just say paint a wall okay. or maybe a road and, you know, being able to film it and then have it project you know, project mapping and projecting it onto another space. So whether, you know, um, so people can see, you know, what we're creating or, you know, how this can be applied, you know, in the real world. Explain it to me better because I'm, I'm like 
So like, in, uh, so project mapping, like, right. so let's just say, you know, being able to display, um, let's say like it, it's a space within the school or maybe we're able to uh, create a mural inside a restaurant or okay. another building um, and being able to projection map it onto the outside. So even if you're driving by, okay. you can see what's going on or at least like student work or, you know, um, so images. We're adding, we're adding the technology piece. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So we're seeing art in, in different dimensions. Yes. And what better yeah. way so of incorporating 21st yes. no, century I'm skills? Yeah. <laughs> this is incorporating 21st century oh my. skills. You know, yeah. we're taking art, we're taking those basic skills and making it, you know, to a level where they're going to be, you know, successful in, yes. in, in the age we live in. And, and this is kind of, you know, um, the old guy in the room, my mom. <laughs> um, but this is going to be a, a normal world for our kids. Yes. And this is how they're going to get things done. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. What other things? What would you, what would you think about changing for next year? What would be your add-ons or your your rethinks? I think that uh, a lot of the kids are inspired by the classes that incorporate a lot of movement or freedom within the class itself. So if we could just look for ways to have the kids outside more. Uh, mm -hmm dancing more, moving more, you know, there's nothing wrong with the programs that are going on within the four walls of the classrooms that we have, mm -hmm. but you could see the, the joy and, you know, the progress that they're making with the freedom of, of literally just moving, playing, running. So if we can get some more dance, maybe mini Zumba going for the little guys, <laughs> right? yeah. um, but I'm sure that you know, there's there's already a lineup of people who want to contribute to next year's program, yeah. and I'm sure that once we sit down and get back into the shop, we'll figure out some yeah. some ways to incorporate that. We're supposed to meet with Mr. Cox soon, I think, yeah. within the next two weeks, to yeah. the, the four of us to yeah. start mapping out next year. Project mapping. What, what, yeah, I was going to yes. yeah, project <laughs> mapping. There we go. Uh, See, <laughs> Cameron, what would you? I would say right now, I would definitely. I think. The elementary program has kind of manifested into a very nice nut, you know, mm -hmm. where I think we could really build on is the secondary. Yeah. That is the challenge and trying to get the students to stay and build on that. One thing that I would love to be a part of is, um, and Jen brought this up, is basically building on those portfolio skills. Mm -hmm. Building a mentorship program yeah. is something that I've always craved for in our school. And by now having speakers, you know, people within the community or outside of our even community that can just tell their stories, I think would be a huge impact. So if we had speakers coming in so that, you know, living out here is kind of like, it's a beautiful area, but we're also living in a bubble. Mm -hmm. And I just want that exposure where there's just different lives different experiences, different stories, and the, and the students having an opportunity to hear that. And I think, especially in the secondary, once they you know, leave our nice cuddly school, that they're able and excited of what they will encounter next. I, when you were talking about it, I saw all the hands. That's, that's what yeah. it, as you were saying, you know, all, yeah. the, all these things they need to get exposed to, all the different hands they need to see. Yeah. Right. Um, yes. Yeah, I would love to do something expanding on that mentorship program, expanding on our secondary program, and then bringing outside um, speakers and um, and then working out something where we can make an extension. Right. Because yeah, one of the difficulties I would imagine uh, going through Bridgehampton schools and then moving on to a college, uh, it, that's a big transition for any high school student. Yeah. But going coming from someplace as small as Bridgehampton to a college setting, um, it's a big leap. It's yeah. a big leap. It's got to be tough. It's got to be is. tough. We, we have to get them ready for that. Uh, and confident. Which yes. I think a lot of what we were talking about has to do with giving students confidence in mm -hmm. who they are and what they can do and that they can do things well. Right. Yes. And, and not just get a good grade, but do it well in their own opinion, in their own minds. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, one of the things Mr. Cox and I are actually doing tomorrow um, we're meeting with the 11th graders to talk about where they want to be in five, six years 
and what internship opportunities we can possibly create for them for next year. Yeah, yeah. Which, that's awesome. You know, talking about getting getting out of the building, mm -hmm. getting it. Yeah. The second half of senior year is most of them are done. Yes. You know, um, it, it's a fun time. Yeah. But it's also could be more productive. Yes. Um, so if we can figure out place that, where their interests are, I don't want to say, okay, here's an internship that I'm going to push you into. I want to say, what do you, what, what are your interests? What do you want to do? Where do you see yourself in the future? And then how can we give you an experience that will help you decide that path? Yeah. There's so um, many routes that you guys can go with yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, yes, that's but we exciting. need to know what yeah. they want. Yeah. Not not what we think they should do, <laughs> but what they We're want. We're letting letting go of the reins. We're letting again. go of the reins. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but even like this, this building. LTV. Yeah. You know, when we were walking around before the show, there were so many opportunities here. Yes. They, they could be working the sound, the lights. Yeah. They could be editing. They, there's, there's, a a well, we, there's a podcast room. Yeah, there's a podcast room. Yeah, we have a student. We have a senior that's actually going, uh, pursuing film and audio production. So, so yeah. <laughs> is he a graduating senior now? Yes, he is. Right. So, he, he should have been here. <laughs> he should be here. <laughs> yeah, he, he should be behind the camera. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but there are many opportunities out here. We've got very good connections to a lot of local businesses, um, the, the science, the SOFO Science Center. Yeah. There's a lot of different possibilities here. We're connected. We just have to make sure we make that connection for yeah. our students, and that it's not forced. Yes. That it's Agreed. it's it's like yeah. you know they gave us the idea and we follow through for them. Yeah. Well, which it's, it's the exposure it's exposing yeah. our kids to the our outside community right and, and the commitment too you yeah. Know. yeah and even you know we, th we always as educators we we get stuck in that are we getting them ready for college no well, we're getting them ready for whatever they choose yes. after high school yeah. i would love to say that everybody who graduates can make their choice between college or career yes but there are different paths that are all yeah. could lead to success and, and everybody shouldn't go to college yeah. Um, but everybody should have a choice. Yes. Well, I think it goes back to the journey, the process. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just, again, getting their feet wet, regardless of what it is. Just having that exposure is so important. And if we could start, like, creating, creating that roadmap, those extensions, however it is, which direction, it doesn't even matter. Yeah. But just having that capacity to build that network right. is what really be fantastic that we can do and build on. I that. think that's why this program is so great that we have. It's really building these bridges, yeah. you know, and, you know, building it for our students. I even think with, with the internships, finding out a pathway that you thought you were going to like and finding out you don't like it yeah. before right. you go major in college, yeah. <laughs> it's exactly. not a bad thing. Yeah. Yes. It's not a bad thing yes. to do. Oh, is that a low risk, low risk setting again? <laughs> yes. 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 Well, I think everything that we've talked about is just like evidence that it's a work in progress mm -hmm. for us, for the kids, yeah. but that everything is meshing together so well and, you know, it's, we're successful and I think that we deserve to pat ourselves on the backs too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. we, did, we did all right for the first year. Yeah. We did all right. Yeah. We did all right. <laughs> Honestly, you three were the backbone of the program uh, and it would not have had the success it had, if it was not for the three of you, um, I would have been floundering without you guys. Oh, oh thank, uh, you. So thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much for all your help. Yeah. Um, I think we're just about out of time. Um, so thanks for your time. Yeah. Thanks thanks for all your help throughout this year. Um, and don't make sure you're here for next year because I don't want to <laughs> Well, thanks for having <laughs> us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'd like to thank uh, the East End Education Foundation for supporting this show. Uh, and... Again, thank you all and thank you.